And now we're going to turn over to number 205, Gleams of the Golden Morning. And that's what we'll see at the breaking of the day, the Gleams of the Golden Morning. When the roll is called up yonder, I hope that we all will be there. Six, uh, 216, when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved and rest shall gather over on the other shore, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road is called up yonder, when the road This morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder for the master from 
When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Good morning, happy Sabbath, church. How are you doing today? Good. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let us keep that in mind always, even when we endure trials and temptation. God is there. He's our refuge and our. Amen. This morning, I would like to welcome everyone who is here in house uh, worshiping today. We're happy that you are here, and for those who are visiting with us, we are happy that you're also here. We will not point fingers at you, but we're just happy to see you and uh, encourage you to keep coming. To our regular members, what would church be without you? So we encourage you also to keep coming and also to spread the joy and the love to others so that they too can come and benefit of the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Uh, this morning, I have uh, a bunch of announcements, but I'll be breezing through them like a thunderstorm, like Category 5 thunderstorm, so just bear with me. I will not be highlighting every announcement. I'm going to implore you to read your bulletin, however. So here's how the announcements will flow. Uh, number one, happy birthday wishes will go out to... Winston Chippewick, who is celebrating his birthday today, and to Trish. Not today. It's coming up this week, we were told. Okay? Yes. <laughs> we're singling you out, okay? So your birthday is coming up this week. So, and I guess it's a top secret. Yes. I'm getting to. Oh, both on the same day. Uh, You'll tell me which one? Okay. Okay. These women are too discreet. They're hiding their birth date or the day. That's okay. But we will wish you a happy birthday when it comes. Future tense then, okay? Uh, so those are for birthday uh, celebrants. And uh, this afternoon, Ed, okay, 2.30 p.m. Do you know what's happening? Sunshine Band, please. Those who are able to attend, please attend. Uh, the folks at the home would actually enjoy your visit when you come to share with them. Amen? Uh, next announcement I will look at will be this evening at 8 p.m. What's happening? Yeah, there's some activities going on. So those who are younger at heart are invited to uh, attend. Those who are old like myself, if you are able to, you can support this venture, okay? I'm just trying to be old, that's what it is. Um, Tuesday, uh, 6.30 p.m., there will be a board meeting. Now note, there will not be an elders meeting on that day, correct? No elders meeting. So show up and uh, be blessed. Next announcement I will quickly share with you is um, 2.30 p.m., AY. Next Sabbath, you have to be here for the next AY meeting. For those of you who missed the last one, uh, one half of your life is missing. And we'll forgive you. There are some who actually had to visit other churches. We understand that. But for the next one, you don't want to miss it. This one is entitled uh, Devotions. And as you're, you've been listening, this weekend is a very uh, high intensity weekend, as it were, with Pavel Goya, um, sharing with prayer and all these. Personal devotion is the best. Without personal devotion, all that we're doing would mean absolutely nothing. So show up and be counted for our next AY meeting. Um, on a sad note, 
on March 22nd at 1.30 p.m. at the College Heights Church, there will be a memorial service for uh, the late Reuben Lawrenson. Yes, he was a member here. Then he moved his membership to Lillooet, B.C. And then fortunately, he's no longer um, in the land of the living, but there will be a, a memorial on that day for him. Uh, last or two last announcements I will share you quickly. Like I say, there are lots in there, so just read through the bulletin. Um, the uh, health ministry of the College Heights Church, they're having a program there. Uh, please read that one. And uh, the next one I will quickly highlight is the annual College Heights Christian School constituency meeting will take place on Thursday, April 18 at 7 p.m. So those who are members of that board need to be in attendance. Those are the few announcements I will highlight quickly very now, uh, for now, sorry. And um, at this time, we'll invite our choristers to lead us through our opening hymn. And our hymn is Old, Hold Fast Till I Come, page number 600. Should we stand? Yes. Let's all stand as we sing this song together. Sweet promise is given to
call to worship today comes to us from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, reading verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All, <clears throat> sorry, all things were created by him and for him. The church is now called to worship. Wherever possible, I invite you to kneel with me as I pray. Holy Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy high and holy name. Lord, we thank you for who you are, a loving, merciful, compassionate, forgiving, and caring Father. Humbly we bow before you today, wretched and sinful though we are. We come, Lord, confessing our sins and our faults. We pray that you will forgive us when we have sinned and misrepresented you in even words or even actions. We pray today that you will cover us under your Son's blood, and please, Holy Father, fill us with your sweet Holy Spirit. As we bow today, as our faces are different, so are our needs and our desires. We cast all our cares upon you because you care it for us, and we pray that you will uh, fill our needs as it is in accordance to your will. As we worship you today, we pray that you will accept our worship. May we receive a blessing and may we also be a blessing to others. We surrender your manservant today, whom you will choose to speak to, on your behalf. I pray that you will hide him behind the cross, speak to him, Lord, and speak through him, and fill him with your Holy Spirit. At the end, Lord, may all of us be drawn closer to you, and may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our offering today is for a local church budget. At this time, I invite deacons to proceed to receive our tithes and our free will offerings.
pray. Father, we thank you for your help towards us. Thank you for the blessings you have bestowed on us. Thank you for helping us to gain an increase. And as we have gained an increase, Lord, we have returned a tithe and an offering. Pray that you'll bless it. And I pray that this funds will be used appropriately so that men and women far and near will come to hear about you and that they too will accept the good news of salvation by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you know my favorite line when it comes on the children's story. If Jesus were here, he would say, children, come unto me. At this time, Carolyn Hoskin will lead us in uh, children's stories. So we invite all the children to come on up, those who are young at heart as well, too. Make yourself to the front. <laughs> I have thought about this children's story for a while, and I wrote it in my quarterly when I was supposed to have this uh, story, and I decided that the title of it would be Homesickness. That was before I read the lesson for this week. I think that would be another title for the Sabbath school lesson from this week. Did you hear all those songs that we just sang? That's the other part of the lesson. Okay, I have had experiences with homesickness. How about any of you? What is homesickness? Away from home, but what, what's the symptoms? Symptoms, I don't know. I guess sickness, loneliness, yeah. Loneliness. So there's a loneliness. Anyone else? Crying, definitely crying. Can you think of anything? Anything else? Sadness. Sadness. Really? Yes. Now, it says homesickness. Does that mean your house? Who, what is it that makes you want to be back where your family is? The people you love. I want to hear what you said. Because that's where you regularly are. That's right. Now, homesickness sickness started for me when I was real little, but I won't tell you about that one. But the homesickness that really, really taught me about homesickness was when I went away to school at, to Kingsway College. I just turned 14, and four months before, I became a sister of a baby brother. <sighs> this was heartbreaking for me. I didn't even have a lot of chance to prepare to go away from home because somebody came from the school and said, we can pay and help, help her through school because, you know, there were five children now. Now, no, that meant six. Six? And uh, so my mom was kind of, oh, we can't afford that, but they promised that it would work out. I was the second child in the family, and my other sister was going to high school. So mom said, my children must go to church school if at all possible. So I was the first one to break the barrier of us going away from home. Well, I was so sick. I couldn't get over being away from that baby brother, as well as my mother, who was so good to me and kind. Something like that sermon this morning that said, your home was your heaven. Mine wasn't quite like heaven, but I had a wonderful family around me. So I missed them so much. I remember one time giving a phone call to home, and it was reverse the charges. That was when phones cost a lot. And I, I got the call, call for, through, and my brother answered, but it sounded like my father. And he said, we can't accept the charges. My heart broke. 
what, my dad won't accept the charges. I went all around that school asking for somebody's quarters, and then I put them in the phone. And I learned that my family said, if mom and dad aren't home, don't accept the charges. But they didn't tell me that. So I was very heartbroken. So that was another part of my homesickness. I was very shy. I didn't know anybody there. And until I got to know people and got to be friends with people, the homesickness left. And you know, when anybody asks you, where's your home church? That's where your home family is. You will always remember that the, the church members are the ones that love you, know you. And the next little bit of the story is about when I was older and had become a nurse. My husband, he was the one that instigated this. He applied to go to a job in the far north of Ontario where we had to fly in, where there was no church for us, and it was not not too easy to think about going there. Okay, so we, we were accepted and we went to this community of First Nations people and we had to only get to fly out, so we were there. No, no going home, the phones weren't cheap yet, and it was hard. Well, you know what? We arrived on a Friday, we unpacked enough things for us to enjoy Sabbath, and we put out the stereo. And we put in an eight-track tape. And do you know what God did to that, us? He gave us a song. Songs make your heart feel better. Well, that song was, We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He never He's fails. never failed us yet. He never will. And that was the song that cheered our hearts, that we have done what we felt we wanted to do a mission duty in our own country. Well, it was a new language. It was new people. Everything was a bit strange. And I got pretty lonely. And I would look in the mirror, and I would squint my eyes. And in the mirror, I looked like my mother. Well, I, they always thought I looked like my mother. And so I could pretend that I was seeing my mother. And uh, that helped me a little bit. Um, so, homesickness is also homesick for heaven. We are looking for our Lord to come, and he has promised us, and he has never failed us in his promises. And if you'd like to pass these out and examine the picture on the front of that, um, we, t we turn to John 14, and it tells us about the mansions that he's gone to prepare for us. And that was one of the first sermons that I ever remembered was expressing all the wonders that God has, is planning for us. And, uh, and the, uh, the wonders that he, he has um, promised us. If we are faithful and that we come to home to him every day. And you know, the last page of our Bible says in Revelation 22, 21, the second to the last verse, surely I come quickly. And don't you see the picture on the front? How beautiful that is. And if we can keep that in mind and know that he's coming any day, any hour, and think of all the songs about that. It could be at morning, it could be at night, and we need to be ready. And that means uh, putting our faith in him, relying on him every day. And that's, that was my inspiration for this. And thank you for being young children and brave to come to the front. Okay, there is a little story inside the booklet, but I wanted you to have a picture of the wonders that God is preparing for us. Would someone like to pray? Very good. Big child. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to uh, be little children here. We're all children of God. 
and we pray that will help us to remember that uh, you're waiting for us in heaven and make us homesick for this place. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. so much of the cuddling that I missed when I didn't have my little brother there. Whenever I'd go home, I'd cry when I had to go back to Kingsway. Bible tells us that God's love is beyond our comprehension. And just think, each one of us can say, this love is mine. We may sound the depths of we may tell the distance to the farthest star, but the mighty love of God cannot be measured. Its dimensions are so high, so deep, so Behold his love in every golden sunset. I can see it in the beauty of a flower, but I feel it in my heart since Jesus touched me and redeemed me by his wonder-working This love is mine, I cannot comprehend it. This love revealed in Christ my Lord divine. When on the tree he died for me, God's wondrous, glorious, mighty
Town Square for the children's story and special music. Thank you everyone who is here. God has a message for you, amen, and for us. So I'm going to ask you to pray and ask God to fill his manservant with his word as he speaks to us. Today we have Elder Ruel Meeks who will be breaking the bread of life to us. I pray that you'll pray a special prayer that God would use him mightily, that our hearts will be touched. Amen. morning, church. It's an honor to bring this message to you today. And as we go through this message, I hope that Christ be seen. Let us start. 1984 is a novel by English author George Orwell, published in the year 1947. It was as a warning against total terrorism. The chilling dystopian novel made a deep impression on readers, and his ideas entered mainstream culture in a way achieved by very few books. One of George Orwell's famous quote states, double think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. George Orwell is saying that it is possible to believe the truth and a lie at the same time. His book is centered around these five words, Big Brother is watching you. This phrase appears several times in the novel. It has become a common shorthand for government surveillance of its people. It invokes the idea of being observed by a powerful but mysterious force over which one has no control. It endeavors to monitor, to control its citizens by suppressing the will of the populace. It's as if their ultimate goal is to be omnipotent, meaning having ultimate power and also omnipotence, which means a state of knowing everything and being everywhere. And that's through the use of technology. If you think that's ridiculous, here we have, you know, I was supposed to have the PowerPoint, but my computer won't work. So we have this all-seeing eye, you know, that all-seeing eye on the pyramid. Here we have it, and it, it's a sign of providence, which is a symbol intended to represent providence, meaning the protection of God. So when you see that pyramid without all-seeing eye, it's a symbol of providence, all-seeing, all-knowing, everywhere. The eye watches over the workers of mankind. Is it possible that Satan endeavors to hijack the affairs of mankind? I want to talk about who is in control of Earth's affairs, the function of the power how it moves through history, present and future. But just, but just to understand this power of force, we are going to um, a complicated but highly symbolic chapter. And this chapter, it takes prayer, patience, and divine help. But first, I want to look at the historical context of that particular chapter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to break your word and to look behind the scenes of this all-working, all-seeing power that watches over us, not to condemn us, but to protect us 
and to lead us to eternal life. Please be with us, dear Lord, as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was the year 572 B.C. By this time, Jerusalem had gone through two captivities. The year 605, Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon. That story is told in Daniel chapter 1. And you can read it because of time. That year was 597, the time of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He came to Jerusalem and captured the city, thus taking the prophet Ezekiel as captive to Babylon. By that time, both Daniel and Ezekiel had been taken to Babylon, and furthermore, the holy vessels of the temple had been taken by King Nebuchadnezzar. To a greater extent, Israel had become subservient to Babylon. Therefore, as you look at the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations, you discover that God's people were wondering whether God has forsaken them. They are looking at their world at that time, and they see everything spinning out of control. They are, taking, they are thinking God has left the earth and he does not see what's going on. You can read that for an, an example in chapter 2 of Jeremiah, verse 6, and Jeremiah 2, 8. And so we see the context, this idea that God has abandoned Israel, God has forsaken the earth, God has rejected the world, and everything was spinning out of control. You know, it's kind of what we're seeing right now, okay? Okay. And at that critical moment, that's when God gave this magnificent vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10, showing that he was still in control and not man, also indicating that he was extremely involved in what was taking place among the children of Israel. We won't study every verse of chapter 1 and 10, but we are going to look at the the predominant points of these two chapters. And then we're going to put it all together and see what God is trying to teach us through these two chapters. Let us begin in Ezekiel chapter 1, um, verse 1 to 4. So Ezekiel 1, 1 to 4. Now it came to pass in the 13th year in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, that the heavens were open, and I saw the vision of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar. And the land of the Lord was, and the hand of the Lord was open, was upon me. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist like a color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Here the vision begins as Ezekiel sees something magnificent coming from the north. Notice Ezekiel 1 verse 4. Ezekiel catches a glimpse of this marvelous scene coming from the north. So three natural predominant that we notice in these verses we notice a whirlwind, a great cloud, and a raging, raging fire. Just keep these three details in, let us keep these three details in our mind because we're going to get back to it. Now, where's this scene coming from? North. Notice it's coming from the north. Question, who lives in the north? 
Well, according to scripture, we look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. So who lives in the north, based upon scripture? Okay, amen. And it's talking about the fall of Lucifer. According to this passage, where does God live? The answer is he lives in the north. So that means he, this chariot of Ezekiel 1 coming, is coming from heaven along with the chariot, we have wind, fire, and a great cloud. Now question, what is represented by the cloud? Now let's look at Mark chapter 14, verse 62. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with clouds of heaven. So here we see, if we look in other verses, we can notice that clouds represent angels. Are we good on that, angels? Okay, thank you. What about the wind and fire? Let's look at Psalms 104, verse 3 and 4. So what do we see there in Psalms 104, 3 and 4? What does the wind and fire represent? In regards to the fire, you know, we can look at Hebrews, verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. And I, I remember the sermon a long time ago that Ed Rice did. Sorry to call you out, Ed Rice. And it was a sermon about um, God being a consuming fire. Do you remember that one? I really enjoy that sermon and I still remember it because it gives you a character of God that we don't often look at. You know, we see God as a raging fire and he has different attributes. But it was amazing, you know, Elder Rice, to go through that sermon with you. Okay, and could, is it possible you could preach it again someday? For all who haven't heard that. So, you know, God is seen here as a raging fire or a consuming fire. Also, we have lightning. And if you look at Job 37, 3, we can clearly see lightning represent there. I'm just going through these really fast because I don't have much time. It's interesting to notice that in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse, verse 4, we see living creatures stand at four corners of God's thrones. We are going to discover that they are moving God's throne. These living creatures, they are moving God's throne. And if you read Ezekiel um, chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, well, we have to pay attention to these details. You have four living creatures, each having four faces and four, four wings. This has important symbolic significance. Now, who are these living creatures? These living creatures, they are cherubims, right? And we can read in Psalms 99, verse 1 to 2. They are commanders of the angelic hosts. And we can continue in Ezekiel 1.10. In other words, you have four faces, the faces of a man, the faces of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. We need to notice in scripture that the number four is a symbol of universality. In other words, it's an emblem of total totalitarian nature of the universe. If you notice in um, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 and 3, it alludes to it. Angels standing at the four corners of the earth. 
In other words, they are universally, universally managing God's creation in his world. They are on the four corners of the earth supervising everything that happens in the world. And this, and, and this is crazy because these four living creatures have four faces. That must mean they are moving in one direction. And the question is, can they see what's happening in all directions? With four faces? Absolutely. They can look to the left, they can look to the right, they can look behind them, in front. Nothing escapes their attention. So when you read Luke 8, verse 17, it makes perfect sense. You clearly see why it's possible, and we could, um, you know, if you can turn your Bibles, we can look at Luke 8, 17, and it says, For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So basically, I'm, I'm looking behind the scenes on, on the functions of this being. How can God be everywhere? How can he see everything? How can he read the heart? And in Ezekiel, it gives us a behind the scene of this mechanism working, being everywhere and seeing everything. You can clearly see why it's possible. Even Jesus said to Nathaniel, you know, Nathaniel was saying, can anything good come from Nazareth? But it's amazing because Jesus, you know, was there reading his heart. And Nathaniel was amazed. So nothing escapes their attention, according to Revelation 7. The four living creatures are in total control and are restraining the winds of human passion. In Sabbath school recently, I heard a comment, and it was from the Spirit of Prophecy, that if angels or if God wasn't holding back our passion, it will be an all-out war. So these living creatures are in total control are restra and restraining the winds of human passions. They are holding back the extreme famines, pestilence, earthquakes, persecution, and an all-out war. It's also interesting, to, uh, interesting that these living creatures don't wander around aimlessly so these living creatures, they are not randomly going around. They have a purpose. They move in one direction when they are on a mission. And we can read that in Ezekiel 1, 9 and 12. Intriguingly enough, these living, these living beings, according to scripture, are full of, these creatures are full of eyes. And you can read that in Ezekiel 10, 12. It's possible to imagine living creatures full of eyes from head to foot. Question, what does eyes represent in Holy Scriptures? What does eyes represent in Holy Scriptures? Well, if we look at Ephesians 1, chapter, Ephesians 1, verse 18, we can see, according to that scripture, that passage, eyes represent wisdom. Eyes represent knowledge. It also represents understanding. Hence, it represents all seeing and all knowing. Right? And that's why mankind use that pyramid with that eye above to say that they are all seeing and they, are, they, they know everything about you. And through the use of the smartphone, they definitely have the opportunity to do that. Wherever you go, they're there with you. And you know, it's said that in the last days, they're going to use the same technology against us because of what we do on them. They're going to bring it up and say, okay, this is what you did on such and such a time. Right? So ultimately, this means that these creatures covered in eyes utilizes wisdom in everything that they do. So these living creatures, they are full of eyes, and everything that they do, they do it with wisdom. They are not random. It's incredible, it's incredible because in 1968, a very famous book was published. The author was Eric Van Daniken. The name of this book was Chariots of God. Anybody ever heard about Chariots of God, that book? 
The subtitle was Unsolved Mysteries of the Past. So Van Daniken took the vision of Ezekiel chapter 1 and concluded that this vision referred to aliens that visit planet Earth. So when Van Daniken looked at this vision, he concluded that these living beings are aliens. And lots of people today actually think that these beings, they're actually aliens from a different planet. These aliens had super advanced technologies that allowed them to construct the Egyptian pyramids. So question surface, you know, how you know, did this Egyptian pyramid come about? And they concluded that the pyramid and all these art artifacts that they found is from aliens and it's from these living creatures with the four faces, eyes, the wheels within wheels. Now, at what speed these beings perform their tasks that God has given them? We can look at Ezekiel 1, 13 to 14. Because we have lightning also in this wheels within wheels full of eyes. And lightning represents speed. You know, if you, see, you think about the lightning flashing across, so, they, so what's saying that they can execute their job from one ends of the earth to the other side. They can go so quickly to perform their task. They're not limited to speed, right? You know, we can pray for something and they can execute it with lightning speed. And we can look at 2 Chronicles 16, 9, and it makes perfect sense when we consider the rapid movement of the eyes of the Lord. And we all know that scripture, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord goes to and fro, and it goes with lightning speed. Nothing escapes his eyes. Question, how do these living creatures run to and fro? These creatures are in the process of moving. If we look at Ezekiel 1, 15 to 17, here we notice we see a wheel within a wheel. Actually, what we have here is wheels at right angles. So if you think of it, how is it possible for the wheel to be go going that way and the wheel going that way? Looks pretty confusing, right? So we have a wheel within wheels at right angles. Now if we look at it, it appears to be in total confusion in regards to the movements. But the wheels within wheels represent the fact that God's throne like the living creatures can move quickly at lightning speed in any direction in which they choose. In, in other words, the living creatures actually make the wheels roll. That is their function, and we find that in Ezekiel 10, 15 to 16. Friends, the living creatures are actually moving the wheels of God's chariot. It's interesting that not only do the living creatures have eyes, but also in the rims of the wheels, they have eyes. So not only the living creatures, but the wheels also have eyes. So, we, so the creatures are moving the wheels with wisdom, and also the wheels itself are moving with wisdom. The creatures, the wheels, they are moving with wisdom. These four living creatures, they are not doing these things on their, in their own power, but through the power and the orders of some other being. So these four living creatures, the wheels within wheels, they're not doing this on their own. We're going to notice an interesting detail in Ezekiel 10, 8 and 21. So who is guiding these living creatures? If we notice um, Ezekiel 10, 8 and 20, we notice what? A man's hand. Now, is this man who's, so who is this man's hands that's guiding the creatures? There's a man's hand guiding the creatures. If we look at 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7, we notice in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, 
that the hands is the hands of the Lord. When God is working in our lives, we must humble ourselves. If God is working on our situation, trials, and tribulations, we need to leave him to organize and work it out for our own good and for his glory. When this wheel within wheels, full of eyes, are moving, we understand that the Apostle Paul is saying in Romans 8, 28, and let's run into these verses because my time is already up. So in Romans 8, 28, we, we can understand what the Apostle Paul is saying. And here comes, even in Isaiah, we can notice in Isaiah 59, 1. So as this wheels within wheels full of eyes are moving through history, it notices something very disturbing. And if you look in Daniel, um, Daniel 5, 3 to 6, you notice nothing escape the all-seeing eye of God. If you notice in Daniel, they were having a party, they took out the holy vessels, and here we see the man's hand. Nothing escapes them. And here comes the all-seeing eye. The message is this, nothing escaped the all-seeing eye of God. Here's another interesting detail. Not only the hands of a man are guiding the living creatures and the wheels within wheels, there's another power guiding the living creatures. And we notice that in Ezekiel 1, 20 to 21. Who else is guiding these living creatures? If you look in Ezekiel 1, 20 to 21, we notice the spirit. Okay. So what is the function and purpose of the Spirit? We can look at that in Isaiah 1, 1 to 3. But wait, we notice another power guiding and giving command. Notice how the cherubims or the living creatures respond to this other power. Everyone had two wings covering one side, two more wings on the other side. So while they are flying with two wings, they are using the other two wings to cover their body, showing reverence. So we notice in Ezekiel 1.26 that there's someone sitting on the throne. Its wheels were like burning fire. So who is this other power? If you read in Ezekiel um, 1.26, we notice it's the Ancient of Days. And we can confirm that in Isaiah 66, 1. And then we can look at Revelation. All these scriptures give evidence that this person or this being who is sitting high above is the ancient of, ancient of days. It's also important to pay attention to what's over his head. And what we notice over the head of this being sitting on the throne is a rainbow. And what does a rainbow represent? It represents God's mercy and justice. If we think about the flood, we can see mercy and judgment. This is an illustration of the fact that God's fundamental aspect of his character is justice and mercy. It was also amazing when Ezekiel saw this spect spectacle, what did he do? He fell down on his face. In these verses, we have angels, we have cherubims, which are, and the cherubims, it's highly to know that they are the, bear, they are, they are the throne bearers. If you think about Solomon, he had two cherubims um, and, you know, on his throne, he had two cherubims on two either side. So they are throne bearers, they are, are, are the throne guardians. We have the spirit, we have the man's hand, Jesus, we have the father sitting on the throne. All are working together in perfect harmony. Now, listen to this statement from the book, Education, page 177 to 178. And notice how Ellen G. White puts it all together. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at first they appeared to be in total confusion, but they move in perfect harmony. Heavenly beings, sustained and guided by the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim were compelling these wheels above them. Upon the sapphire throne, 
was the eternal one. Round about the throne was a rainbow, the emblem of divine mercy. As the wheels like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the, in, the complicated play of human events is under the divine control amidst the strife and turmoil of nation. So basically, Ellen G. White is saying, even though things are pretty confusing right now, it's, they're still under the control of the eternal one. He that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of earth. Ellen G. White writes and tells us, one of the wheels function within the wheels full of eyes with a man's hand guiding. They are moved by the spirit and controlled by a man sitting on a throne. She says the wheels was a complicate, compli was complicated that appeared to the prophet. In so much confusion, it was under the guidance of an infinite hand. Even though it seems complicated, it was under the control of a divine hand. The Spirit of God revealed to him that moving and directing these wheels brought harmony out of confusion. So the wheels within wheels, it looks pretty confusion, but it brings harmony out of confusion. So the whole world was under God's authority. Myriads of angels of glorified beings were ready at his word to overrule the power and policy of evil men and bring good to his faithful ones. Today, we live in a world filled with fear, uncertainty, apprehension, confusion, wars, and rumors of war. A e um, economic collapse also plagues the mind of individuals. But God is seated on his throne. We do not have to fear because he is everything, he's doing everything under his mighty hand and he's giving the commands. You see, friends, the eyes of the Lord roam across the earth, beholding the evil and the good alike. Nothing, nothing eludes his, his scrutiny, scrutiny. Does it make more sense when we take reference from the wisest man ever lived? And that's Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14. It states that everything, every secret thing, whether good or evil, will come to light. Even his father, King David, understood the function of God's operation. Brothers and sisters, as the hand guides the wheels full of eyes, the eyes that run to and fro across the earth, the eyes that govern every act, whether for him or against him, will you allow the same hand and the same government to guide you through life. And my prayer guys, is whenever you're going through life and you consider the wheels within wheels, this vision, just remember God is not random. You know, if you go through the Bible, you know, God had, to, Jesus had to be at that well with that woman. He had to be there at that time. Lazarus, he had to be underneath that tree. Wheels within wheels does everything and make everything function. Nothing is, Jesus wasn't random. You know, Jesus didn't go to the pool just randomly. He didn't heal the blind man randomly. Nothing he did was random. Everything was for a cause. And, you know, in, in Ezekiel, at a time when Israel was saying, man, this is crazy, you know, it's confusion. You know, even a Sabbath lesson, you know, is saying, um, why does the wicked have to prosper? All these questions, right? And at that time, even Ezekiel was worried, you know, is God still in control? And, you know, uh, uh, it's kind of funny because, you know, it's, it's like a show and tell. You know, God flexing his muscles, showing his glory. God said, yeah, you know, I'm the boss, right? And he showed him this glory. But basically, he, he told Ezekiel, whatever you see today, go and tell it to the others. And that's the same thing that God is doing for us today. When the wheels within wheels full of eyes with all his creatures, when it's working in our behalf and something good happens in our lives, we need to go and tell it, right? So when you're going through life, just remember Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10, and it, it explains the function of, of how God works in our lives. And this wheels within wheels is working on our behalf.
Thank you. We're going to turn to 426, I shall see the king. Let's all stand as we sing this song together. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. 